Welcome to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, uh, August the 8th. I'm Mark Sign, the minister here at the Northfield Church, and uh, for the past oh, year and a half, uh, we've been uh, presenting the PM services on YouTube. So I uh, hope you're with us, and I hope you've kind of gotten used to us and have a songbook. Uh, we'll sing a few songs, we'll observe the Lord's Supper, and we will have a message that I hope will be uplifting to each one of us. So uh, from your songbooks, Songs of Faith and Praise, if you would turn your books to number 51. 51. <clears throat> Father of mercies, day by day, my love to thee grows more and more. Thy gifts are strewn upon my way Like sands upon the great seashore Like sands upon the great seashore Father of mercies, God of love Whose gentle gifts all creatures share The rolling seasons as they move Proclaim to all thy constant care Proclaim to Constant care, Father of mercies, may our hearts ne'er overlook thy bounteous care. But what our fathers and imparts still on in grateful praise and prayer, still on in grateful praise and prayer. Oh, that was wonderful. Uh, turn your books to number 97. <laughs> 97. I sing praises to your name, O Lord. Praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory 
to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. And in preparation for the observance of the Lord's Supper, if you turn your books to number 366. Three, sixty-six by Christ redeemed. By Christ redeemed, by Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he come his body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread and as we drink we see the Till we come, and thus that dark betrayal night with the last advent we unite by one bright chain of love. Twentieth chapter of the book of Acts, uh, in verse seven, uh, the writer says, "Now on the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. This is the memorial, the memorial feast that Jesus celebrated with his disciples at the Passover, the night uh, in which he was betrayed, and um, it is a wonderful memorial. You know, we see memorials." all around us to things. If we go to our nation's capital, we see memorials dedicated to uh, great presidents. We see memorials dedicated to wars that were fought. In this case, this memorial is in remembrance of the greatest event that ever took place as far as the Christian world is concerned. And that is God uh, giving his son to be sacrificed for each one of us. And so as we hearken back and we think for just a few moments uh, about what this really means, uh, help it to just be embedded in our hearts that we're thinking about Jesus' body that was beaten and nailed to the cross. That we're thinking about Jesus' blood which was shed uh, for the remission of our sins. And so let's do this as, with as much seriousness as we possibly can, knowing uh, that this is the bedrock of our faith, the bedrock of our salvation. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was uh, willing to uh, not just live this life here, but to be tried as an innocent man to be crucified uh, and killed in the worst possible way that a person can be killed. And that he literally gave up his body uh, in our stead. Help us to understand that that is what Jesus did. And as we partake of this bread, we remember that body given for us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. We know that blood is uh, the life-giving substance that flows through 
the bodies of animals. Uh, and in our case, it flows through the body of human beings. And to be more specific, it flowed through the body of Jesus, our Savior. And uh, he shed that uh, blood, and it was innocent blood. He did nothing to deserve what uh, took place that uh, terrible day. But uh, we do know that he shed his blood. Uh, and uh, that life-giving blood is exactly what it uh, infers to us, that through that blood we have remission and forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray for the cup. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just uh, give praise to you for having this as part of your plan. And we're, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to comply, that he was willing to give himself up, that he was willing to shed his innocent blood, that we might have our sins forgiven. Help us just to remember the sacrifice. Help us to remember the shed blood. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And placed here at the end of this memorial service uh, to the Lord, we have another memorial of sorts, and that's the memorial of gratitude. That's the memorial of giving back uh, that with which we have been prospered. And so as we think in terms of of uh, what our lives are really worth and uh, the mission of the church here on earth. Let's give with a, an open heart. Let's give with an open mind. and Let's give with a, an, an open pocket and realize that uh, what we have, what we are, uh, all come from you. And if we are to further your work, your kingdom here on earth, we know that money is needed for this to take place. Help us to think of this as we give. Let's pray. We thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father, for the opportunity that we have to give. It's a great opportunity. It is just one small way of showing uh, our gratitude to uh, you for what you have done for us. We're so blessed with the abundant spiritual life that you've given to us, and for many of us, for the wonderful and abundant physical life you've given to us. Help us to show our appreciation to you by giving back what we have prospered only because you have allowed us to. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And if you would turn your song books to our final song, number 422. When we uh, have the lesson this evening, you'll hopefully understand why I chose this song. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. singing part of our service. I know the Lord was praised through our efforts. We don't have to have wonderful voices uh, to sing praise to the Lord. We can sing praise through our voices. We can sing praise from our hearts and we can sing praise 
through our actions each day of our lives. If you were there this morning, uh, you probably heard the somewhat unusual title to our lesson this evening. The title is Body, Soul, Spirit. And I believe when I wrote it in my preacher's notes and it appears in the bulletin, it is body-soul-spirit. If we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul says this, May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. Now, do we notice that Paul mentioned all three? And so since he mentioned all three, to me, that indicates that every human, each person is made up of three parts. May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete. So all of us are made of body, soul, and spirit. Now, let's get the easy one out of the way, all right? We all know what the human body is. It's the flesh and blood part of us that everybody sees. It's when we start talking about the soul and the spirit that sometimes... If we're not careful, we can get confused just a little bit. I hope that this lesson um, kind of uh, uh, takes that confusion away. And if it doesn't completely, I'll give you enough scriptures to go to that you can explore this for yourself. And so... Uh, we know that the body is completely different, but if we hone in on the soul and the spirit, since Paul mentions them individually, to me, the implication is that they are not the same thing. It indicates there's a difference between one's soul and one's spirit. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse 12, it tells, that, tells us that there is a difference between the soul and the spirit because it says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as, get this, the division of soul and spirit, the division of and so if we're dividing, it must mean that it's two things, the division of soul and spirit. Now, first, let's use Jesus as our example. At the very point of Jesus' death on the cross, he said, he looked skyward, and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. To me, that indicates that Jesus' spirit went back to God. Because we know where his body went. Joseph of Arimathea, along with Nicodemus, uh, petitioned uh, the government officials to be able to take Jesus and bury him in a, a tomb uh, that Joseph had. And in Luke chapter 23, verses 50 to 51, it says, they took the body of Jesus down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid him in a tube cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. So he got to go into a tomb in which no one had ever Lane, Luke 23, 53. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached that very, very famous sermon, he preached about the death, the burial, and the resurrection 
of Jesus in Acts chapter 2. And in that, he quoted a psalm. It is Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. And he applied that passage to Jesus. He applied it this way. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Acts chapter 2, verse 27. He explained further on in verse 31. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Now notice, Peter uses soul and flesh, which indicates, obviously, that they are two different things. Thus, the example of Jesus, in that example of Jesus, one sees, one, that his spirit returned to God. His body was laid in a grave, and his soul went to the Hadean realm until he was resurrected three days later. Thus, Jesus, who was physically human, just like any other person on earth, was made up of three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit. And so, that is true of any human that has ever lived. Every human is made up of a body, of a soul, and of a spirit. And so uh, we got the body out of the way. Uh, I don't know if I like using those terms necessarily. Uh, let's go ahead and get to the explanation of the soul and the spirit. The, I, I don't think we have any understanding trouble understanding the body. It's simply the, the flesh and the blood which one day will return to dust, whether it's buried in the ground, whether the body is cremated. You know, cremation just turns the physical body to dust faster than it would if it decayed on its own. Now, Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gave us this principle when he wrote, then the dust, that's our body, will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Notice, just as Jesus' spirit went back to God in his last words on the cross, uh, Solomon says pretty much the same thing. Um, that's what happens to the spirit. The spirit is that which gives the body the ability to function. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 9 reminds us that God is the father of spirits. That's Hebrews 12, 9. And in the epistle of James, James explains when death occurs by saying, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also is faith without works dead. See, he uses the separation. I'm not going to do a faith and works sermon here. I'm going to do a body without the spirit lesson here. That's what happens when everyone dies. That uh, spirit detaches itself from the body. And so let's get, hopefully, an explanation that will help us just a little bit about the soul and the spirit. There is a difference between the soul and the spirit. However, there is a confusion on the parts of many. Now, why that confusion? Part of the reason for the confusion 
is that the Bible often uses these terms interchangeably, right? It uses soul and spirit, and the two terms seem to mean the same thing. Here's where our discerning comes in. All right, you ready for this? A, a super important word. What we have to understand here is the context. When the term spirit is used or when the term soul is used, which one is it is determined by the context of the writing that has been done that will determine the meaning of the word. Now understand, in the Greek language, there is a different word for spirit than for soul. Now some of you uh, may have heard this before. If you've heard enough sermons, you've probably heard that the Greek word for spirit is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. That's like pneumonia. It has to do with air. Pneuma. So, uh, spirit is not physical in terms of I can touch this. I can feel it. I can smell something. I, I can taste something. Spirit is not that way. And so pneuma refers to that which enables the body to function. Now the Greek word for soul is suche, P-S-U-C-H-E, P-S-U-C-H-E. And that is the eternal part of a person. One soul is that which is eternal. One's soul is what is made in the image of God. And that's what makes people, that's what makes Homo sapiens different than other organisms in the animal world. Animals have a spirit. They don't have a soul. All right? So, pneuma for spirit, suche for soul. We are made in the image of God because of our soul. Now, often the word soul stands for the whole person, not just his or her eternal part. Luke said of those who obeyed Peter's command in Acts chapter 22, when Peter says, repent and be baptized for the mission of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Luke records in verse 41, that day they were added about, get this, 3,000 souls. Doesn't say 3,000 spirits. It says 3,000 thousand souls, the eternal part, because when baptism took place, it put people in line to be saved, to have salvation, and to have eternal life for that soul to go on to eternity. So a soul, the eternal part of a person can exist without the body but a body cannot exist without the spirit remember jesus said into your hands do i commend my spirit when he commended his spirit to god jesus breathed his last because the spirit was no longer in the body the body was just that encasement now. It was that uh, physical thing that you're looking at right now that each of us have. The spirit 
had left. When Jesus went into the Hadean realm, he didn't have a body. Right? He was given an immortal body when he was resurrected. It was an immortal body which looked like his fleshly body. Remember, he and miraculously, after the resurrection, appeared to many, many people, especially uh, to his apostles. And he was recognizable. So uh, his immortal body, which looked like his fleshly body, but that body was limited in several ways as his physical body had been limited. When we go into the Hadean realm, when we pass on, we wait for our resurrection. And in that Hadean realm, from what I understand, we will not have a physical body. But at the resurrection, when we go on to eternal life, we will be given an immortal body, just like Jesus has. You want reference for this. If you have your Bibles available, if you have your devices available, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now, I ask you the question, have I made this more confusing or have I made it clearer to you? Here's what I do know. When one is baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, according to Acts 2.38, God gives that person the Holy Spirit. We know those famous words. Okay? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So for Christians, not only do they have their soul and their spirit, but they also have the Holy Spirit residing in them. How do I know that? Because the scriptures clearly indicate it, that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, everybody has a spirit. Everybody has a spiritual part. Not everybody has a Holy Spirit part. But everybody has a spiritual part to them. Again, we've already mentioned, it's what causes people to do the things they do. You know that term, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our spirits guide us to doing the things that, uh, that we do. Finally, in today's world, now this may be unfortunate, and, and I think, you know, I think we have to clarify a little bit, but people are mostly concerned about their physical body, and they're not as concerned about the condition of their soul. How sad. Because you know what? We can go to heaven with a physical malady. Blind people can go to heaven. People that can't walk can go to heaven. People that die from cancer can go to heaven. In this time of the pandemic, people who die from COVID-19 can still go to heaven all right and so for Christians uh, it is the body unfortunately that we're really really concerned about but damaged bodies can get to heaven damaged souls cannot you know ultimately our physical body however it shakes down, will turn into the dust from which it came. But that part of us, which is eternal, 
the part that each of us has, the soul, will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. And if you want reference for that, John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. And so with that, I think we have to uh, get up in front of the mirror and look ourselves in the eye and say, what's the condition of my soul? Have I given my soul over to God through Jesus Christ? Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross as we commemorated with the Lord's Supper <clears throat> a few moments ago. What is the condition of our soul? We know that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added. That entity that leads into eternal life. And so with that, we give that invitation this evening to those that want to start their Christian walk, to put their souls, to take their souls out of jeopardy and put them in to safety, the safety of having obeyed God into obedience, obedience to uh, confession, repentance, and baptism. And with that, along with the spirit that each person has, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit, that indwelling spirit that resides in us. What is the condition of our soul? If you haven't come to the Lord, it's not in good condition. Remember, there are only two places the soul can eternally reside. And so if you need to come to the Lord tonight, uh, I know we are virtual. Uh, I can't reach out and touch you. But if you need to come to the Lord tonight, get on the phone. Uh, get in touch with one of us here at the church, and we will assist you to get you started on your walk. I pray that each one of you uh, will take this lesson and that uh, we'll have just a little bit better understanding of body, spirit, and soul. Let's all pray together. Our God, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for making us the people that you have made us, the, the crowning touch of your creation, that we are indeed uh, created in the image of God, in that we do have a spirit, in that we do have a soul. I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would bless us on our Christian walk, that each day we will try to uh, uh, do in our lives what we ought to do from a moral standpoint. Bless us and keep us close to you. Comfort us when we need comforting. Lift us up when we need lifting up and rebuke us when we need to understand that we've done something wrong and we need to change our ways. Continue to be with us, continue to guide us, continue to keep us on that straight and narrow way that leads us to eternal life with you where our souls will re re reside. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name, amen. And as this new Delta variant of the COVID uh, is uh, uh, out there and more people are, are, are getting it, I pray that you would continue to be safe. May God bless you all.